Hi everyone and welcome to Growth Leap. I'm your host, Michel Gagnon. We talk to pretty awesome business builders who are designing and growing meaningful and innovative companies. Imagine an entire motion capture studio in one single suit. A very expensive and complex technology, which used to be only accessible to deep pocket Hollywood studios, is now available to indie film and game makers. Matthias Sondergaard is co-founder and chief product officer at Rococo, a startup based in Copenhagen and San Francisco. They've embarked on a mission to democratize the expensive and inaccessible tools of traditional motion capture. Hi, Matthias. Hello. Finally, after uh, a bit of logistical challenges and scheduling challenges, we finally managed to talk. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. And thank you for having me in the show. It's great to have you on the show. Uh, let's get started right away. Uh, if you don't mind, I suggest that we introduce you a bit to our audience. It would be great if you could tell us a bit about Rococo. What is it that you are doing? What kind of products you're offering uh, just to get started? Yes, of course. Um, Rococo is um, a company I co-founded five years ago um, as kind of a foundation from a film school project at the National Film School of Denmark. And what we aim to do is basically democratizing access to motion capture tools. So what we try uh, with developing a range of tools and make it way more accessible for people working with motion capture despite technical expertise and budget. And so they can actually create a lot of creative stuff uh, with motion capture tools. And you're saying that you created that to democratize motion capture, but you started the company with that in mind or it was you know, a byproduct uh, of another project? How did you end up launching Rococo? Yes. Um, maybe just tell you a bit about the film school because that was actually what started in the whole thing and that's pretty interesting. What my two co-founders um, would like to do at the film school at the time was merging the best from animated series, computer games and theater. And for that purpose, they needed a motion capture uh, so they could actually live transfer the actor's movement mm -hmm. into a game engine so they could live interact with a, a crowd like nice. a live crowd game. So that was really inspiring. And it was a kid's show where kids could interact in real time. And it really, really engaged the audience in a, in a way we've never seen before. So it started out as being a creative new medium of entertainment because we thought that theater can do a lot of very interesting pictures because it's authentic. You're there right now, right here. Yeah. Whereas computer games can actually put the players in control. So you don't have to be a passive Uh, engage in the entertainment medium, but you can actually actively decide what you want to do. And then lastly, we wanted to bring this magical fairy tale universe of animation into the melting pot as well. And that actually turned out to be a really, really strong entertainment medium, especially for kids. And for that, uh, the film school bought a really, really expensive optical motion capture system. And working with that for years, we saw how difficult it is to work with a motion capture, how static it is, how much technical expertise you need to actually get it up and running. So all of these pains were something we experienced during the show at the film school, and we really want to change that so everybody, including ourselves, could start to make these creative uh, projects way easier. Okay, and you know, for the audience who might not be motion capture experts, yes. can you tell us a bit how the project happened You know, uh, yes. initially and how you ended up developing a, a product that is completely different? Of course, of course. I guess many of the people listening to this as well have seen um, Gollum in Lord of the Rings and seen Avatar and how filmmaking uh, was radically changed with CG computer graphics and also what you can do with an actor acting out an animated character. And that was completely mind-blowing when they did these uh, films. Uh, and that was done with the optical motion capture, which is now the kind of the golden standard where you have a lot of optical cameras in the set. Yeah. I guess most of the people have seen it with a kind of a black, very tight suit with these uh, ping pong balls. Yeah. So when a couple of cameras can see this, then they can make it, uh, can kind of make a ping point cloud 
and then they can make a kinematic model of the human and then transfer that move, movement onto an animated character. But that is extremely difficult and extremely hard to use. So what my co-founder Anas uh, wanted to do was uh, utilize the inertial sensors starting to be very uh, easy accessible due to smartphones and tablets. So instead of having a lot of cameras, we basically want to embed an entire technology studio in one simple to use suit. So embed all the sensor technologies in a suit, you could simply just put on and then you could do motion capture everywhere for a fraction of the price. Okay, so instead of having this, like these many, many cameras and the very complicated and more expensive equipment, everything is in your suit, more or less. Yes, exactly. So we use gyros, accelerometers, and, and compasses, all in these sensors, to drive uh, the kinematics of a human being. So it's kind of a variable technology, like clothes, sports clothes. You check it on, you connect it to your Wi-Fi, and then you can start to use motion capture basically everywhere. Great. And, and just before we get uh, more into this, I want to talk about you. So you have a, um, a master's in economics and philosophy. How did you end up becoming co-founder and, and chief product officer of Rococo? I always like those personal experiences. Yes, of course. It's a funny story. I, my co-founder Jacob and I started out playing a lot of badminton 10 years ago and then a lot of squash. And he always thought it was hilarious that I studied philosophy at a business school and I was very engaged in tech history, industrialization and these kind of uh, phenomena. And I was very curious to see what happened at the film school because it's a small community of creatives always trying to push the borders of what can be done with creative mediums. So we became really good friends. And then I studied uh, 3D printers uh, for my entire master's in, okay. in New York and the U.S. to see how creatives could actually start to utilize kind of new 3D creative, creative tools like 3D printers. So you really saw how the physical world and the digital world kind of intertwined and how you can start with a digital concept, make it physical or take a physical concept and make it digital and then really build fast, quickly for all kinds of creative things. So that was really uh, my, my focus at, uh, when I studied and see how especially the smaller uh, creative people, the smaller studios could really utilize these tools. So when I discussed with Jacob and he asked me whether or not I would like to co-found Rococo, I saw that there was a lot of similarities from 3D printers to cell phones to computers who start out being these mainframe computers to being a personal um, toolbox, which you could start to use for everything. So we really saw a big potential of actually democratizing these tools as well. So basically everybody could use it for creative uh, goals. Nice. So it's an, an exciting adventure. Yes. Um, Matthias, you'll be speaking at the Wear It Innovation Summit in coming up very soon in Berlin on June 25th and 26th. Is the smart suit the core of what you will be talking about? Uh, yes, I really believe strongly in that people can really experience something firsthand. So it's always a very strong impression that you actually show what you have been building and show how you in real time, right there, right now, can actually demonstrate what it can do and what you can utilize for this. Because not only can it disrupt the way that we animate for uh, entertainment purposes, but also for a variety of other application cases as well. So at the center will be the Smart Pro presentation, of course, but also how I envision the future, where we see a lot of kind of intersection and, and going back and forth from physical space to a digital space. And what we need there is something to understand our behavioral stuff like face tracking and body tracking and finger tracking. So that would be the core of the presentation, yes. Nice. So you will do a demonstration as well? Yes, definitely. Oh, nice. Nice. So uh, I want to talk about the business, but since we are we started with the smart suit, maybe uh, um, it'd be nice to dig deeper into the, the product development, especially since it's your um, core function at Rococo. So so you've developed that body suit uh, that has something like 19 sensors and a battery uh, mm -hmm. that you're selling for about... $2,500 you were mentioning. What, what's, what has been the greatest challenge for you in the development of that product? That's a really good question. Um, we were very naive when we started out. Um, <laughs> I guess I can tell that. And we thought it was something that we could use uh, with uh, $1 million in funding and a couple of years and five people. And then 
it turned out to be way more com complex uh, because we needed the hardware parts in place. We needed to write our own software, our own fusion algorithms for the sensors, and a software application which could run on Mac and PC. And then, of course, starting to distribute, produce. And there's a lack of actually hardware expertise in Denmark now okay. because it's so expensive to actually build and develop things locally because a lot of the competences have now moved to Asia because it's so much cheaper. Mm -hmm. So getting that kind of the core team established took us some years and also the core tech. But there was a lot of pieces in the puzzle who had to come together so we could actually time it right to start to ship it out to the market. And, of course, we also just believe that we could ship it out globally make it like a web shop where everybody just bought it and they had to deliver it. And then, of course, there's so many things which you didn't really consider when you start out this journey. But I would say the complexity of having both a hardware, a firmware, and a, and a software product in, in coming together and, and a beautiful harmony, that was very tricky to time and know when you should actually release it, when it was good enough for people to start to use it. Yeah. So you said you started with uh, funding with a team of five when you yeah, got, I, when you got started, I guess you did not necessarily plan the software already. You were what was the how did you like if yeah. you if you give me a short timeline of yes. how things went? Sure. And the first year we we did actually bootstrap the entire product development okay. by selling uh, several entertainment shows. Uh, firstly, for Tivoli Gardens, I guess it's the world's oldest amusement park, uh, central of Copenhagen, okay. and they really liked the concept very much. So we developed the Little Mermaid as an interactive show where kids on a daily basis kind of entered and then they had this experience. So we had that and then we had a theater play where we digitalized the whole thing. So Hans Christian Andersen could actually start to imagine his entire fairy tale world and then suddenly the creatures he have came up with in his fairy tales start to pop up in the scene in the, in the actual play as digital puppets. And, and that kind of gave us enough funding to, to to create uh, the first prototype of the suit. And you and were, uh, sorry, you were using off-the-shelf or existing sensors. solutions? At yes. That? Okay. Uh, in the beginning, it was a total hack. Okay. So we really barely made it, but it was a kind of a combination of depth sensors, the Kinect at the time, our IMUs, and a lot of things. So we had the entire control because we were in charge of the entire pro uh, production of these 3D shows. Mm -hmm. And then based on that, we actually had the first prototype approximately one year after we funded, uh, four years ago. And that gives us enough, enough tech that we could actually raise money from a VC. So since uh, four years ago, we have been VC-backed, and we did a small Kickstarter campaign to actually prove that there was a market, and also to see how much should this be a kind of a developer kit for kind of really the low-end uh, makers, you could call it that, and how much should it be a pro tool, which you can use with already defined uh, software tools and plugins for the biggest 3D content creation tools. And it turned out that people actually wanted a more professional system. So we did a pivot at the time to make uh, way more features, make it way more complete before we shipped it out. And I think that has been a really a great learning experience in the first couple of years. And, and how many people do you have at the moment? Uh, we're around 20 people. Uh, all our engineering staff uh, is in Copenhagen. Um, and then we have a small office in San Francisco where there's three people now. Uh, driving sales and marketing because Denmark is nice, uh, but super small yeah. when it comes to the creative industry. So we knew from the very beginning that we couldn't build a technology product for kind of a niche market. Uh, globally, it's big, uh, but we had to go international super quickly. So now we also have customers in 60 different countries and more than 1,100 systems out globally. But, but it took us some time to actually get the outreach you need. Yeah. And when you look at the um, product development and manufacturing, everything happened in Denmark or you, you have partners producing the suit elsewhere? We have a lot of partners. So we basically do all the R&D, uh, all the testing, all the tools for production. And then we outsource production. So textile is done in Asia. Everything is uh, developed locally, but then we have been traveling uh, back and forth a lot of times. The electronics, the cables are also done in Asia. And then we assembly and do the final test in Copenhagen, close to where we are. So we can make sure that we get all the newest firmware, that we know the calibration is as good as it can get, and all of these kind of things. Okay, so you ship everything out of, of uh, Copenhagen? Yes. Okay, great. And, you know, to come back to, let's say, on the, the business side, you 
are basically offering, and correct me if I'm wrong, so you offer this, you offer indie film game makers a, a means to make that high quality content at, uh, as you said, a fraction of the price. What's your biggest customer segment? Um, we have kind of three major customer segments. So we have people who make classical animation for animated films or animated series. Uh, and then they typically combine it with doing keyframe animation, which has been the typical way to do that. So they sit in Maya and then they kind of almost do like the old fashioned way where you kind of draw, you kind of move uh, one limb, let's say one, one hand from one position to another, and then you interpolate. That's one segment. The other big segment is game developers. And that has typically been a very big pain for them to do proper character animation and gameplay. Uh, you would see the AAA game companies, they have always had the means uh, to do very, very fantastic character animation. But now we actually provide it for smaller studios. They can actually do a lot of awesome uh, animation in the games. Um, the best case we have in Copenhagen is IO Interactive doing Hitman. So we really try to learn from the community uh, around the gaming as well. And then the third last the uh, biggest segment we have is ed uh, educators and research institutions where they really want to have a tool where it's easier to capture a lot of data and where you're not kind of restricted to be in a lab, but you can actually be mobile. You can do capture at home, outside in the park. You can do it everywhere, and it's super cheap, so you can actually do multiple access at the same time. And that's really offering a complete new type of data set for research and also for uh, learning purposes in general. So it's very easy for students to actually use the suits themselves without a technical expert. So I would say that's the, our three main uh, custom segments. Nice. I read somewhere that uh, Sony and Scott Kravitz, uh, one of the uh, <laughs> yes. well-known animators, um, were some of your initial customers. Is this, could we imagine that you guys will end up being a well-known product in Hollywood, or it's it's not the target segments. Of course, uh, we would like to do, to be that, but I think <laughs> the general shift globally, when it comes to content creation, is Hollywood and California in general, where yeah. we also have the office, is now kind of um, not to be rude, but that's where all the money uh, men and all the decision makers are, are sitting now. Of course, and all the creators who actually do all the content. They're more sitting in, in Canada due to tax reason. They're sitting in India, they're in China, they're in Mexico, all kind of other places in the world. So what we actually see, which is really exciting, exciting for us, is the development of a completely new niche where everybody, also with a smaller budget, they can create the most fantastic game on Steam uh, with tools like ours and Unity and Unreal, and they can really get far without it. So we see a really variety of competition. So it's not only EA and Ubisoft and Sony, who now can make fantastic games, but smaller studios can do the same. And that's really what we would like to do, kind of fight for the, the smaller studios so they can actually make really good content as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you have any uh, conversations with the likes of Sony or anybody else that you've uh, bumped into or sold to about you know them being involved or in one way or another influencing your future product development? Um, a lot. We mainly uh, talk a lot to Unity because that's also Danish founded. Yeah. So one of the products we have now, which also trying to, to solve one of the big problems, was getting access to motion capture data fast. Uh, that was making the motion library, which is now the biggest marketplace of motion assets. So that is also created for the, from the biggest mocap studios in the world, uh, making accessible for $3 per asset for everybody who wants to be creative with these things. So if you need a backflip, somebody uh, doing crawling a ladder or falling down the stairs, you cannot do it yourself. You don't have an actor, you don't have a mocap suit, then you can buy it from this motion library. So that is developed together with Unity. Then we develop a lot of tools together with Unreal. Uh, that's kind of a subset of Epic, who's doing a fantastic job as well to make real-time uh, rendering possible with a range of really powerful tools. So we have... We are talking a lot with Unity and, and Unreal, officially partnered with Unity and doing a lot of stuff with Unreal. But then, of course, we also see that other studios are trying to make social interaction more interesting, like Facebook, they acquired Oculus. So we're speaking a bit with the Facebook team about how can you actually be live in a VR session as well. So that's also some discussion going on right now. But we are more interested in the creative industry uh, for now. So the newest partnership we have been talking uh, or we're launching here at the end of this year is with Autodesk, which is kind of the biggest software provider of 3D tools, mm -hmm. uh, content creation tools. 
So we are launching a lot of combination uh, a product integration for the motion library directly in Maya, which is going to be a major thing to make it even more accessible for everybody. Nice. And so you have salespeople in San Francisco? Yes. And everything else, like in terms of sales, everything else is done, you know, with online promotion or how do you actually get into the, the sales and marketing of, of Rococo? Yes. It has kind of been our strategy from the very beginning and uh, that we should try to make a product which is so appealing and so easy to use at a very fair price point that people would start to recommend it like word of mouth. So we don't have to spend a huge budget on sales and marketing activities and then be very transparent. So both our product is designed so it's very easy to use, but also our pricing offering should be very transparent. So we basically sell a kind of a pro- professional tool like e-commerce product. So you can buy everything from our web, web page. All the prices are transparent. Everybody can see how it goes. So that is also a different way to do a classical B2B approach, where it more like, looks like a business-to-consumer approach, because we really believe that transparency for the end user is the best we can offer. Uh, so we really try to drive that in a very transparent manner. So you have, let's say I want to I wanna do it home myself. I want to get yes. into the business. I need to buy a smart suit pro. Yes. But I also need the um the software which is studio, am I right? Yes. Yes. And and then I'm good to go or Yes, and we have uh, the main core for, uh, features of Studio is also for free. So you can go into our website today and then you can download Rococo Studio and then there's already some sample data, some assets and you can start to play around with see how it works. Uh, because it's a really powerful working tool for uh, utilizing motion capture data. And then you can start to see how it works with, if you live stream that to one of your characters in a 3D uh, content software. And you can also see which format you can export to, how easy it is to demonstrate for your friends. So that is also for free and you can download it right from our website. Yes. Okay, great. And I've seen that you are working on a smart, on smart gloves. Yes. This is the next baby that's coming yes, up. It, it's, that, it's that does, really not wake up, does not wake up at night. <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost. Almost, yeah. Uh, we have been thinking about from the very beginning because what we see is actually when you do performances as an actor or a person in the suit, the timing of the movement is really key to the authenticity of the movement mm-hmm. and getting the timing be- between the, the facial expression, the body expression, and what you do with your hands is super key. So really where we want to go is having a full capture performance uh, setup. So you can both capture face, body, and fingers in the same go. So you can basically start to make kind of live productions. So you can start to render everything live with Unreal or Unity. And you can basically just produce it on a, on a shot list without any post editing. So that is, of course, our dream. And to get to that dream, we're launching a face tracking integration uh, in a month. Uh, which I'll also be happy to talk to everybody about. And then we also, uh, later this year, coming with the gloves. So we will complete kind of a full uh, tracking system. And that's super exciting. The other exciting thing about the glove is that you will be able to use that without the smart suit or the face. So it could essentially turn into kind of a generic input device for any computer uh, computer device, including a smartphone. And when we see kind of these uh, VR, AR glasses getting more and more um, accessible, cheaper and better. I really hope and we really hope that you need some kind of other more natural input device, uh, which is not a simple mouse or keyboard or these big handles you have to hold when you play a VR game, but you feel free to interact in the virtual world as free as you do in normal communication with a person standing right next to you. And for that purpose, we think that you should have your hands free so you can make gestures, you can make interaction, you can grab things, you can interact with things. So that is really exciting as well. Great. And um, I would assume that there, you know, whenever somebody comes up with a good idea, there are other people interested in developing something very similar. When you look at the competitive landscapes, you know, what, what do you see? We have, I think the biggest challenge for us is actually we are only a few companies uh, making motion capture with IMUs. Mm -hmm. So so our main challenge is actually not competing with the other companies. Uh, I think they're doing an amazing job, but basically uh, get the awareness of all the creators out there that what they can achieve with these types of motion capture tools, which is not super hard to use, which is not super uh, expensive. And that is kind of still the common knowledge 
uh, about motion capture. That is something which you have to have a big studio, a technical staff, tons of expertise, and really deep pockets to get started. And that's really something we would like to change. And then on the other hand, we of course see a lot of new, very exciting cameras, uh, which is being used, especially in phones and in VR devices, which is super interesting. That solves some of the problems. So you can start to make hand gestures, but you still have kind of a capture space, which is super limited to, you have to look in a certain direction and you cannot have occlusion. So that means that a simple interaction with props, a chair, a table, a game, then you, you lose a lot of data in that process. So making it very limited to very certain use cases where you cannot really interact with the surroundings. So we think kind of a natural way to interact is really the key to making this uh, global accessible. And if we look at the future, well, you know, you've talked a bit about the, the new upcoming products that you have. But if you look at maybe the industry more holistically or more globally, where do you see the, the future of Rococo in terms of product development in the next, I don't know, two, three, four years? Yes, um, that's also a very interesting question. Of course, we can use 20 minutes to discuss that. <laughs> go for it. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, hold no, on, no. I'll go get a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> no. What I really hope uh, that we will see that we will be um, kind of the tool set which will power digital human motions. So I hope that more and more people will be creative with these tools and that you start to see more and more people have a digital twin or digital avatar starting to do teaching courses online, starting to tell history, starting to get involved in a more kind of virtual setting, start to utilize gameplays, game mechanics for all kinds of things, starting to have digital host in receptions. So you don't really just chat with bot, uh, bots in a browser, but you start to actually utilize the 3D depth, 4D time, more natural integration, uh, interaction with computers and with robots. And that, I hope, is going to be powered by our capture tools and our animation tools. Great. And do you think, and I think that's a bit what you've done at the very beginning, it's it's something that could grow into performing arts, you know, or become kind of a, a tool that, you know, you see live as well? Is this Is this an application that you foresee could become a market for you? Definitely. We already have a lot of performers who use this for dance shows, visual shows. Uh, a combination of both, uh, DJs, all that kind of stuff. We really want to have a visual and kind of a music experience, uh, which is kind of a location-based experience where you really want to engage people in a new way. So imagine that you can basically use your entire body as a big joystick to uh, control the light, the music, the visuals, everything in the room that is extremely powerful because you get all the timing available uh, for you. And with the glass coming out, you can also start to make live gestures as well. Uh, so, of course, that is extremely interesting. Um, and then in vision, of course, that you can actually be joined by other people who is not physically there, but they can kind of join this VR session so you can make live performances in, in kind of physical and non-physical spaces. And that's going to be very interesting to be part of. Do you have, I would assume, you know, it's a quite complex product and you know as you said there are a lot of elements that there's the hardware part the software and, and everything else how does your support effort looks like you know i'm sure a lot of your users or customers you know have questions or have some troubles how are you set up to to support uh, your your customer base yes i think the very foundation of uh, doing a good job is making a easy to use uh, system yeah. So we really try to make it as easy to use as putting on regular clothes and a very standard way to, that you set it up with your Wi-Fi and stuff. So we have, of course, documentation. We have a lot of uh, tutorials online where people can see that. And that is kind of the foundation for people to get into the system. And then we do uh, online demos, online support calls like now. And then, of course, if you live close to Copenhagen, then we have a group, great community meeting quite often and we also take in people for workshops telling them what we can do especially with all the new tools and all the new integrations uh, because it's, of course it's hard to follow all the new stuff that you can do with our tools uh, but we try to communicate a lot and do a lot of documentation online so people can find it right and if we look uh, at the the product development you know we've talked a bit about the initial challenges that you you faced at the beginning 
because you did not really know what you were getting into. <laughs> but now that you have the experience, w- what are the key challenges? You know, I've, I've had some experience myself in, in product yeah. and, and business management. Um, you know, s- finding talent sometimes yeah. can be a, a challenge, but what, you know, and I'm sure you have your fair, your list <laughs> of, of things to fix or to tackle. What, what are the top three things you have on your list these days? Um, I think definitely we need to complete kind of the product offering for this full performance capture. Uh, and that will be done in 2019. And I'm extremely, extremely excited for that. And based on that foundation, we really need to scale growth and also community building to tell everybody who is creative and working 3D that they can actually start without kind of a big budget or technical expertise to use these tools. So there's a big, big, big kind of challenge ahead of us teaching and learning inspire people what to do with this because there's a huge growing market of creators developers gamers doing fantastic stuff and they don't know that these tools exist okay so it's more on the execution side not not as much on the tech side or of, of course there's many technical challenges there um, another thing I can mention is there's not a lot of standards in the animation industry. Yeah. It seems like all the bigger studios have to find their own standards of how they do the character design, the rigging, the animation structure. And so we really try to make some common standards across all the major platforms so people easily, easily can go from one platform to another without changing the, the, compli- the complexity of their assets. And that's really something which make it easier for people to create something really fast and make it uh, more accessible. And for instance, we saw a lot of things which is good for the community with Apple uh, launching the, the face uh, capture tools with their iPhone X. And, and they also standardized a way, a really decent way to talk about how we deal with face capture. It's very technical, but they did a really great job to making some general standards. And, and we really push to make better and more open standards for working with character animation. Okay. So um, I've read somewhere that you've raised uh, close to $5 million in funding with a recent round in February of this year. Can you tell us a bit about what it, it is like to run a VC-backed company? And, you know, it's it's more of a personal experience type of question to have for you. Yeah, of course. Personally, I think it's super exciting and that you can actually get funding to create something which wasn't possible without the VC funding. And it's also a really good time, uh, I think, uh, in general, to raise VC money. And there's a lot of really uh, good money out there, and there's a lot of smart people who is willing to back good projects with a good uh, commercial outreach, of course. Um, so that has been really exciting, and we are all first-time founders, so we really learned a lot in the journey. And one thing we've learned is it's hard to get uh, funding for a hardware-based uh, startup, yeah. especially is from Bay Area VCs. They more or less, all of them want software-based uh, startups, and we are a combination of uh, software and hardware. So it has been easiest actually for us to raise uh, capital from Nordic partners who understood us, our background, and our team. And we had longer time to really uh, get a good and healthy relationship with our VCs. So, so your VCs are uh, are Danish. Yes. Okay. So we have uh, some Danish VC funds, uh, classical funds, and then we also have Nordic Film, which is the oldest film production company. And then we have some really good angels involved as well. So it's a really good mix of people who can really guide us in this journey. And do you also find it um, useful to have VCs who do uh, who come from, you know, the same country as in you know because I'm. Canadian and I've lived in uh, in Germany for a while now and I've yeah. I've had the chance to exchange with VCs in my pr- previous life uh both from the US and Germany and the expectations from those VCs are very very different you know in terms of of growth in terms of having revenues or not yeah. so um do you feel it's it's been an advantage for you Yes, I definitely think there's a big cultural differences uh, for the VC landscapes. Of course, there's some common denominators that they want return on investment, <laughs> and that's, of course, a given. Uh, but then, of course, there's cultural differences, and, and people in Denmark are really looking for the next uh, big company, and they really want to facilitate a, a healthy local e- ecosystem. That's good for us. And then we have a rich uh, design tradition, uh, rich cultural tradition, and hardware tradition uh, with some really great companies. 
So it has been uh, good for us to actually recruit some of the people coming from these companies and also VCs who know the hardware game as well as the software play. So that has really been a, a good thing for us to mainly work with local VCs. Great. Maybe one last question. I actually have a list of rapid fire questions that are very <laughs> easy if um, okay. if you're okay with that. Of course. Um, but before that... I would like to ask you maybe a, a last question more on your experience as a founder, as a business person. If you had to go back, what would you do differently? It's a classical, um, it's a classical yes. question, but such a, an insightful one. Yes, um, I would actually spend more time defining the product features. Um, of course, I'm a product man, but more in depth to really focus and not try to do too many things at the same time but really take some features, make them complete, and then see whether or not you can actually add value to uh, users very quickly. And I really like the fact about having a bit of control to have revenue. We had revenue from the very beginning, mm -hmm. and that really helps you in the process. But to really find the most, what can you say, low-hanging fruits from where you can generate more revenue and also recurring revenue, that really helps your journey. And by because the, then you get then you get really insight uh, feedback as well for actually paying customers, and I think to get paying customers on board as quickly as possible really helps you in all aspects of building your business. And w when you talk about low hanging fruits, you're referring to the initial shows or performances that you were selling at the beginning. Yeah, uh, yes, that was kind of we needed to do that, and that was extremely in interesting. So we can actually have control, and we can build everything based on that, and, and not be controlled by VCs. Because then it has to be executed super fast. Mm -hmm. But then we really learned a lot about their whole ecosystem and learned what kind of tools we actually wanted to do. But then also after that, to start as simple as possible. So you don't have to be 10 people from the very beginning. Because if you burn a lot of money super quickly, then of course you also have a shorter runway. And it's really nice to have some kind of buffer. Great. And, and so basically you developed a product for yourself, right? Initially? Yes. You which, can say that. which is what um, you know a lot of, of, of business guru or you know experienced people say yeah. when you develop something that you will use yourself it's always uh, it's always a good start yes definitely and I think that just to be engaged with people who would actually use it a lot teach you and learn you how to build the most valuable things the quickest way possible do you happen to you know in Berlin there's a lot of a sound slash music software related uh, companies do you guys happen to also create your own you know games or movies uh, we thought about doing that in the beginning but it was simply too much and that's again coming back to the focus area so we also after the year we thought that we were doing more plays and more games because that's also really engaging for people and we have a lot of game developers in our, on our team <laughs> uh, but that was simply too much So now we're mainly facilitating the tools and then engaged in helping and facilitating the best, the best possible tool sets for, for our users. And then they do the games or the animated content. Of course, we would like at some point to do that again, but I guess that will be in a couple of years. Yeah, I, I really like what you are doing content or marketing wise on Thank you. social uh, media channels. You're featuring a lot of the, you know, your users or customers creations it's, it's it's very cool and i think for people who don't necessarily know the technology it's uh, such a great way for us to understand exactly what's possible and not possible with uh, with your product thank you so much so which brings me i i'm sorry i lied <laughs> i told you i had only one but i i had a few follow-up ones but um this is the time for the rapid fire question moment it's more you know personal easy question so it, it, it doesn't hurt okay are you ready yeah So what's the first thing you do in the morning? I am always thinking about getting back to a structured to-do list. Uh, but uh, what I actually end up doing is talking to all my colleagues. Uh, I very much like to get a personal contact with everybody at the office to hear what they have been doing yesterday and if they have any questions for the task of the day. So I would say that's the first thing I do every single morning, talk to my colleagues. What's the last book you read? Oof, that's tricky. Uh, I'm reading a one about AI in China, uh, and it's super interesting to see how they find that their Go, uh, when the Go championship with actually an AI, was their Sputnik moment. Okay. So I think that's the re most recent book I've been reading. I read recently that AI was able to beat 
team a online game that was you know that you do uh, you play in teams I don't know yeah. if you've seen that so um no. another step in that direction what's the name of the book I actually forgot okay you can send that to me I yes think. I'll do that <laughs> uh, the one thing that keeps you motivated doing something which is extremely challenging and then in the same time really valuable for for people not only myself but for people who would like to use this tool okay. what time do you get up in the morning <laughs> between five and six due Just to kids to the kids <laughs> not 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 due to extreme discipline no what time do you go to bed uh around 11 it depends on how many skype calls i have to do with people in the u.s Okay, I thought you were gonna, going to say depends on how many podcast interviews you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, which habit have you developed recently that most improved your you know, life or lifestyle? Oh, that's tricky. They can't I don't be, know. They can't be all easy. So you want to pass? Yeah, pass. Okay, okay you, get, you get a free pass. Finally, how do you measure uh, if you are successful? I guess if you get a random external validation of what you're doing, more like, aha, this is super exciting. I, I really like these uh, aha moments and it really encourages you to do more. So when external people, people you don't know or people who randomly just reach out and say what you do is awesome and we really like to work with what you have been created, that's really engaging. Great. Well, thank you so much. Just before we go, I want to remind the audience, so I encourage the audience to go on your website to look at the video that you have on your landing page. Okay. It's uh, rococowithkays.com. It's an amazing, as you said, it's an amazing video and it makes the, the product sales uh, by itself. So this is great. Thank, thank you so much for the recommendation. Uh, no, for the talk. Just as a reminder, you'll be um, at the Wear Innovation Summit in Berlin, June 25th and 26th. Yes. Really looking forward to uh, meeting you in person. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Bye-bye. Cheers. All right, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the show. As always, do not hesitate to connect with us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and check us out at stunnena.com. Thanks for listening. Et à la prochaine.